working? I think that's working. Oh, it's very quiet to call it working. Hello? Hello? I can hear you. Okay, that's good. That's a start. Issue is, the uh, webcam, for some reason, won't connect with Zoom, which is fun. Uh, is it because you're using it in another it could be. application at the same time? But if you want to see my stupid face, you should probably just quick click on the Twitch link and that should have it. Yeah, I'll do that. Should be I, did, I had it open a second ago, actually. I just I sh shut it because I didn't want to get an echo or anything. Yeah, um, you can just leave it on mute, to be honest. It, it'll be fine. Yeah. Cool. So right. I've had to put as much of you on the screen as possible to make up for the lack of me. So, if I'm thinking right... Yeah, that looks fine. Right. Okay. Yeah. I can see you now. There we go. That's fine. I'll be like five seconds delayed, but that's okay. It's not the worst technical issue I've had on this stream in the last two hours. Oh, there was How's it been going? It, it's, it's been alright. There was one point where the bitrate just hit the floor for an hour. So I just played a pre-recorded interview and hoped it made sense. And I think it did. The audio worked, and that's all that mattered. Fair enough. I so uh, I when we did our football manager thing, I was really paranoid about it going wrong. I actually like drilled holes in my house so I could have an Ethernet cable for it because I was worried about Wi-Fi breaking and stuff. So, but it was all good. Yeah, I've I've got the fun of an Ethernet cable, but it's also a little bit janky still. So yeah, it's always a bit of an adventure to see when it's going to go wrong. Are you a seller? I'm not. Well, technically. It's Blackpool, so basically, being an old hotel, it's got like four floors to it, and this uh, is okay. just the floor that I'm in. Everyone's asked, is it like a cellar? And it's like, yeah. technically yes, but it's also an office -y room. It works, fine. it's fine. There's rabbits over there. Um, so, I've got a small list of questions that I'm going to adapt a little bit. Um but other than that, it's just going to be a bit of a ramble, if that's all right. Cool. So one thing that I was going to ask that I was a little bit curious about was how did you get involved in writing and podcasting with the Square Ball? Because it's something that I've always been a bit curious, like, how did you get into that? Um, I first had something in the magazine when I was, back when I was like 14, I guess. Um, I used to buy it on the street in the spot I've since sold it out on the on Lowfields Road. Um, so I've just used to buy it. Quite, kind of liked it because it was a bit subversive and it had swearing in it, which when you're like 14 is quite, it's quite cool. So um, got into it through that and then um, had little bits in it on and off. Uh, it was always terrible because I was 14 and I didn't even, I didn't really listen at school either, to be perfectly honest. So the quality of stuff I was sending in was abysmal, but I had bits in it. And then as a result of that, I got on the, the forum and stuff that existed alongside it and still exists now, actually, although hardly anyone really goes on it, I think. Twitter and stuff has kind of killed forums to a certain extent but um yeah so then I was always on that and that the magazine declined over the years but the forum kept going so then once the magazine stopped being made there was discussions on the forum people saying you know what can we do can we get it going again and I was one of the people who said yeah I'll have a I'll have a go at yeah, it at the give, time give I was kind of, yeah at the time I was like mid twenties, didn't have any commitments or anything, so I thought, yeah, I've got, I've got time for this. I can, and as it was, I did quite a bit uh, of it during my actual day job at the same time, which was nice, just sort of on the sly, just working away, um, getting paid by ITV while I was doing it. So, uh, yeah, I was doing, going to it through that, and then I started doing it with Dan, who hosts the podcast now. We were, the, it was kind of us two for the first, first issue of it, putting it together alongside a guy called uh, Oddie, who was involved with it way back when um and then moscow got involved from issue two onwards and then from the plate beating scum was the was the time we did the first podcast so dan had done radio before he was on um uh, i don't know what he was he might have been doing some stuff on radio air at that point so he kind of had access to a studio and also knew vaguely what he was doing in terms of hosting and things so the, the podcast went from there but from for me and Moscow, we'd never done anything like that before. And I'd not, in truth, I'd not really had any great aspirations to do anything like that. I never thought it was particularly something for me. But then it was one of those things we started doing it and enjoyed doing it. So, yeah, and it went mm -hmm. from there. And it's, it's kind of, it's gone all right. It, it, so, it spiraled a bit, hasn't it? Yeah. 
Um, yeah. I'd just like to say something to the chat if you've got any questions at all, then that's fair enough, just chuck them in there. I've got the chat down here, so it's not like I'm going to miss it. Um, there was a question that someone had, and it was, um, is the square ball now like a full-time thing? It is, yeah. Um, from it was, it was last summer I, I quit my job because uh, I hated it. It was the, enough, was the yeah. main was part of the main reason, and it was and it was also coinciding with Bielsa being at Leeds, and it felt like everything was well. It, it obviously ended with defeat to Derby in the playoffs that season, but it felt like everything was growing to a point where it it, it could become a proper job, and my actual day job had become quite all encompassing as well, so I could no longer do all my square ball stuff while doing another job. So I, it was it was taking up loads and loads of time and. It was one of those things that it, it needed to go one of two ways, really. It needed to either be a case of we cut back on what we're doing and potentially stop doing it altogether, or it needs to be a break and we do it on a sort of professional basis because there's just so much so much stuff to do on it. Like we, when we decided to get the podcast up and running again, because I know we'd, we'd, we'd obviously been doing it since 2010, but it'd be pretty, been pretty sporadic in the way we'd done it. Dan got a job up in Newcastle and so we couldn't record at the same times and stuff. So it, it just kind of fell apart a bit in the middle, but then we decided we'd, we're going to sort of try and get it off the ground again. So we were just recording really late at night on it and things. So Dan had, he was doing drive time on Metro radio up in Newcastle and he'd be getting back to Leeds sort of nine o'clock at night. And then we'd, we'd be going in and recording podcasts, you know, until sort of midnight. And then when we started launching the extra ball as well, we were then going through. So like one in the morning doing those. So, and then you're up again, the next morning to take the kids to school to go to work and it was it was it was sort of tough in those you know it's obviously a very um a very limited scope of toughness it's not the i wasn't exactly down a mine or anything but you know when you think like yeah. just mentally you feel a bit like frazzled by life so um yeah so yeah I chose chose to quit my wife thankfully was kind of supportive in it and i was like we're not going to be earning that much money for the foreseeable but um Hopefully it'll be fun, yeah. and hopefully it'll grow, and it, and it has grown as well. In fairness, so I mean, promotion has has maybe saved us a bit. I don't know if we'd if we'd not gone up, if there'd be the same growth potential for it there. I don't know, but it always kind of felt like, as much as I'm a pessimist, it did kind of feel like we were on the verge of something. So um, yeah, but it, yeah. I mean, summer's been great for us. So, but it's no, no regrets on it. To be honest, it's all been uh, it's been good, and, and having the the year, the first year of doing it full time has obviously gone fairly tits up because half of it has been spent in lockdown with um, with a pair of six year olds as well, which has not been not been particularly conducive to getting a lot of stuff done. But it's um, it's been easier than I think it otherwise would have been. I feel like if we didn't go up, you'd have a lot of potential for more misery casts, and I feel like you're going to get a lot of listeners on those ones, just because everyone wants to sort of wallow in it. Yeah, I, th I think w what we found is over the years that. People who are fans of ours, they quite like the miserable stuff. But I think to pull in a broader audience, you need to be a bit... There needs to be some yeah. positivity as well. You, you need some, to smile sometimes. <laughs> yeah, exactly. There's only so much you can... You can enjoy what you can get, I think, from, from the miserable stuff, which is... I, I'm glad that we did it, and it's kind of... I think it's given us a certain level of credibility that we were there for all of that. Um, but I wouldn't particularly want to go back to it. It's nice. It's nice. It's almost going back to those early days of buying square ball and writing stuff in there when it was about football. And that's that's what first got me into Leeds United. It wasn't looking at the company's house documents and trying to work out, you know, what was going on with Chilino and why the catering rights have been sold off and how the Macron kit deal structured and all that sort of shit, which yeah. was, it was boring, but it's kind of, it was where we were at the time. So. Yeah, as you mentioned, being a quite pessimistic person, um, you've mentioned a few times the fact that you sometimes bet against Leeds because, let's be honest, that's a fairly profitable way to go, assuming that Leeds are going to do something wrong. Mm -hmm. uh, I've got a friend that I think has potentially outdone you on the pessimism front. Um, last year, uh, towards our promotion, he thought, no, it's too good to be true. And I think in total he lost something like 500 quid on Leeds not going up, which I... was... I did the same. To be fair, is I I had loads on us by the end. The more the more nailed on it became that we were going up. The, the I was just like, oh, just another fifty quid on that. Why not? 
in fairness, with part of the thinking with Square Ball stuff as well was that if we go up, like we'll sell promotion merchandise and we will sell more magazines and stuff. So there'll be, it's kind of, it was a more legitimate bit of business hedging on it as well. It's like, this is going to compensate slightly for the fact that um, we're not going to, we're not going to be able to sell anything over summer. Whereas as it was, it's like, you know, selling more of absolutely everything. It's been, it's been absolutely ridiculous this summer. Mm. So, um, but yeah, I, I think I was the same. I think by the end of it, I was due to win about like 10 grand or something ridiculous if we didn't go up. It's an investment, it was, isn't it? <laughs> it is. It completely is. And I'm, I'm delighted to lose it. It was only about, it was, it was like a few hundred quid, which, you know, you spend on a season ticket, don't you? Yeah. Uh, Cameron, that guy also put, um, he made a bet two years ago when we signed Patrick Bamford that he'd never score a hat-trick in a lead shirt. And oh, the really? fact that he did last week means he has to get bleach blonde hair in the next couple of weeks, which is nice. going to be quite fun. Uh, we've got a couple of questions in the chat. Uh, one from Black Badger one is, um, what's your best moment as a Leeds fan? Oh, um, I think it probably would have been going up this year, but it, it didn't quite happen in the way we expected, did it? Probably my happiest bit was still going up from League One. Just that I was a bit too late to the championship in 92. I started going to 93, 94, so I, I missed those times. Champions League was good, but I think the League One years, it felt like the conclusion of something for me because it was... As mentioned, that's kind of when we started doing the magazine. But those those years were when I was sort of young and single and had an all right enough job that I could afford to go to every away game and get pissed all the time and not have to worry too much about things. And it felt like it was a nice conclusion to a thing that I'd really seen through because I'd been to I went to most of the away games at that point and every home game felt like an event as well because it was like we'd kind of go out but you go at the pub before you go at the game you go out afterwards it was just like a, it was a really i remember it was a really fun time and league one was getting up from league one was like the the conclusion of it and the night that that followed that promotion was just really memorable and i don't know the whole city felt like a big party which i, th I think it certainly it did to an extent i think i guess this time around but not not in quite the same way and not with the numbers that it, it deserved ultimately more of a calm party this time around because People couldn't go nuts. Yeah, I, yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm hoping that my best time is, you know, the best times are yet to come. You've always got to hope that, haven't you? That there's a, a still a, in my lifetime, I'd like to think there's a league win in there, or at least an FA Cup or something. It's just to see us lift something would be, would be nice. No, I know we got a trophy this time around, but it's, it's essentially a, a trophy that means promotion, isn't it? It's the, the championship trophies. That's the main thing that you get from it. Yeah, but when it comes to my best moments as a Leeds fan, you see, I. One of my first memories is of Leeds going down from the Premier League. I distinctly remember being in my granddad's kitchen and knowing that something big and bad had happened and it was to do with the football. And I was like, and like since then it had been very, very, very downhill until Bielsa rocked up. So I'd, I'd say the last two years that have gotten me to actually care about football again for me. Mm. It, is, it is strange that the last two years. I feel like it's it has got me interested in football in in a way more like how I used to be that in terms of it as an actual game and stuff because it was almost like it felt it felt a bit like going down was the separation of leads from other football almost I I sort of tuned out of other stuff like as a kid I was really obsessed with the Premier League as a whole and I knew I could name like Liverpool's third choice keeper and all that sort of stuff there was, when we went down I sort of tuned out from all that it probably did in truth also coincide with me being old enough to go out and do some other stuff as well as opposed to just sitting playing champ manager in my room but um it was it was one of those things that i feel like in the last couple of years i've kind of got an interest back and i'm because we're doing some interesting stuff on the pitch it makes me more interested in football as a whole and there was only so much you could take out of the football of dave hockaday and paul heckingbottom it was like well this is i'm watching this because it's leeds but it's but I don't with care about the football of it. Yeah, with yeah. the complete knowledge that what I'm watching is cack, and I could be, I could watch literally any game and it would be as good as this. Whereas now, I watch any game that's not Leeds, and I feel that's rubbish instead. So it's it's nice. I mean, I'm a football fan again because of Bielsa. Yeah, like even Chelsea and Man United last weekend. I know the managers are both not actually managers. 
in the nicest way possible. But um, that was awful. I think there was one shot on target in the entire first half, and I was like, you people are paid millions between you every single week. Please shoot. You're allowed. Yeah, it's um, weird. Having, after all these years, I mean, uh, we've now got a manager who I wouldn't swap for probably anyone, which is crazy, because I think for most of the of the last 20 years, we've I've, there's been a dozen managers I'd have rather had sometimes literally hundreds of managers I'd have rather had when it comes to like Steve Evans or someone, but I, I wouldn't change Bielsa for the world. I, I absolutely love him. Yeah. Uh, we have another question. It's not a question. It seems to be more of a demand by Meadie92. Um, can you tell Michael we want another football manager marathon? Uh, it's weird seeing your head without being drunk and signing third division Brazilians halfway through a football match. Yeah, it was well. We we did one for the first lockdown, don't we? We've got, we enter lockdown two. Uh, how long have you been on this? You do know about lockdown two, don't you? I do. Yeah, I yeah. I, I had a really fun moment about um, six o'clock where I was playing FIFA and I was managing to lose match after match of FIFA whilst hearing you're going to be stuck inside for another month. It's going to be great. Yeah, but it was good. It was really good. It was the the football manager thing that we did? So you never know. I'll see if we can do it again. Twenty four hours was. In fairness, I think I could have probably done the the not of sleeping bit. It was when the hangover kind of kicked in. At about it was about three four in the morning. I started feeling a bit just like I wanted to go to bed, and it all became a little bit end of a house party vibe. But it was uh, we got through it, and I think the promotions definitely helped. So we did. I mean, we did go back and finish the second season. So we do have a, a save game somewhere where we are now in a Premier League club. So we might go back and finish it at some point. You never know. I reckon you should give it a pop with the new one when that comes out and just see if you can quite manage what's been going on this season so far. Mm. Because it, I know that football manager always makes someone's management abilities go a little bit too far, but I feel like pushing for like sixth is going to be a stretch even in football manager. Yeah, mass- massively so. It's complicated, the new one as well. I feel like it's... I I do still play the the newer ones sometimes, and it's but I play like the the slightly pared down version. I think it's the touch version, still on a desktop PC, so you can add more leagues and stuff. But I just find it's not quite as as onerous. The the um, all the training sessions and the press conferences and stuff on the full version these days, I just feel a bit like I feel like it becomes a bit of a proper job and like it's just a lot of hassle that I don't need. I quite I kind of like the pick up and play versions where you can just. You know, we can just sign Terry Bo West and crack on. Yeah, I, I remember my last playthrough of Football Manager 2020. At the start of it, I basically went, right, everything that I don't care about, I'm giving to Corboran. Anything beyond that, fine, I'll take it. Uh, there's another question. Uh, will there likely be another raffle for Leeds Cares at any point? Uh, probably, yes. But we need to get some stuff. I think we've got um, well, we did. We got assigned, you know, the 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 specials we did over summer. Just to see if I've got one on the side of me. I haven't. Um, oh, yes, I have. I've these. got one on a bookshelf over there. If you we couldn't did. find it, <laughs> these that we did. Um, yeah. We did get one of those signed by all the squad, which uh, we gave to Martin Highwood, who, who auctioned it off. So we, I'm not sure if we've got another one of those spare. If we have, uh, then we might do. I've also got one. Says to Michael, and it's signed by Bielsa. So Ooh, that's a bit nice, it, isn't it? It's amazing. I'm so, I'm so. The problem is, I'm that pleased with it that it's not on display anywhere. I've put it in a jiffy bag and put it in the loft because I'm scared of getting it damaged, and I feel like it's just something I need to keep nice forever, which is kind of ruining the the whole point of having it. But it's one of those things. Like I've got, other, I've got all the odds and sods of signed stuff, which is which are like on the wall and in drawers and stuff. But with that, I was like, this needs to get, this needs to go straight in a bag and be treasured. It's an Indiana Jones style relic. Anyone ever opens that bag and there'll be spikes coming out of the floor for him. Yeah, exactly. Uh, when it comes to Twitter, like you mentioned earlier, in the way it's killing forums, um, is it a bit weird for someone that until recently was working a full time, fairly normal job to have ex footballers lose their minds at you because they've lost 3 0 and think that they've got you. I think, just, they, they think that you've taken all of the bait and it's. Is that a bit weird? Uh, yeah, a little bit. I mean, Twitter as a whole is is weird. Like it over, it was during the start of lockdown. Actually, I ended up with um, 
to take this completely off football. Curtis Steigers uh, tweeted, it was just after, it was after Luke Ayling, in fact, that scored his goal against Huddersfield. And I likened him to a young Curtis Steigers on the podcast and somehow someone ended up tagging him in and ended up chatting with him. And this is like the guy that like, my mum used to have his CD in like 1993 or something. And then all of a sudden we, we're following each other and have a little chat on Twitter. So that was weird. Agbon Lahore, I mean, it's, I don't understand the guy. I don't think he's the brightest. And I, I don't, because I noticed he's doing some adverts for some betting company and stuff now. I don't know if he's a bit skint and he's trying to build himself a, a media profile like in a slightly shortcut way. And he thinks the best way of doing that is just generating a bit of. Um, just annoying enough people. But, yeah, if he thinks I can, if I can get like 2,000 replies to a tweet, then maybe Talk Sport will have me or something, because that's, you know, that's kind of the method that they, they employ on stuff. So. It's the Michael Owen mean, route, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Although Michael Owen, when you, you, you hear him on TV, he's just the, the blandest man in the world, isn't he? Like he's, He struggles to have an opinion on most things. But um, yeah, Bon Lahore, I don't know. Bless him. He's, he's, if it had worked, I'm glad it didn't work out for him because he'd have been unbearably smug and he'd have had no reason to because what he was saying was not based on anything. It was just, it was just him trying to get a reaction, I think. Yeah. I mean, he did get a reaction, but that reaction did come after a 3-0 win, which I I feel like Leeds fans have generally come out on top of that one. <laughs> yeah, it's hard to... There's not only so much you can say, isn't there, once, when you're trying to defend your position after you've you've called someone a... What did he call us a myth or something? I can't remember. He, I think he called Bielsa a myth because all we do is run or something like that. Yeah. And, and it... Yeah, it, you, you sort of got the feeling like, A... Although you play a lot of football, you've clearly not watched that much. And B, you've lost 3 0. Please stop trying. Yeah. Um, I forgot what I've, I was I've, before, I've, got, I've got a question for you, actually. Someone, oh, my, my, my mate has asked, is that B. Joe Blackburn? Um, and he doesn't mean you, he means the other one. Does he mean the really fat one from a documentary? He means that one, yes. Yeah. That... <laughs> <sighs> yeah. Bad times for you. Yeah, I remember. I, I remember the first time I was made aware of him. I think I was in primary school or something when um, we were all googling our names. Like, oh, I wonder what I look like. I wonder what Dan looks like. I wonder what Jamie looks like. I wonder what Jet. Oh, oh, it's a very fat kid. Fantastic. Yeah, yeah. it's. I've yeah because I I do the um, player ratings that the square ball occasionally retweets, which is really helpful because it helps me get like a lot of people putting the ratings in which helps get them more accurate um but every single time that happens there's always someone replying to it with that guy and it's like i, ju- I just i want to break out from him just call yourself call yourself joey or something just change it slightly so people don't joey don't blackburn think of it, but... i don't know that sounds yeah. a bit australian to me yeah maybe so a bit like tony blackburn as well Maybe with the Y on the end, I don't know. Mm. But yeah, have you? I, I take it you've seen the documentary. Uh, I've avoided it with oh, all that I've got. Yeah, <laughs> I I just know that there is a fat Joe Blackburn. I don't know anything about him, and I don't want to know anything about him. He's got Prada Willie syndrome. I remember watching it. Was it like a big documentary? Or I I thought it was just some Channel Four thing. It was fairly niche. I think it's it's my mate, in fact, who has replied saying, "Is that the Joe Blackburn?" I think it was him who made me watch it because uh, ah. he he was fairly obsessed with it for a time. You might so. just have a problem with Joe Blackburn, and I've just been on the receiving end of it. Uh, another question: uh, the Phil Hay show. That's yeah. something that's always a good lesson because it sort of blends the nonsense of the square ball with the general knowledge of Phil Hay. Um, not to say that you don't have the general knowledge, but obviously you've not quite got the connections, or at least they're not as prominent, shall we say. Yeah. Um, where did that come from? Was it Phil that said, do you want to do a podcast, or was it from The Athletic? Or I think it was, The Athletic wanted to do them, they wanted each person to to kind of do a, a podcast about their club, because obviously they have dedicated correspondence for each club, um, and because of the nature of the way they're set up, they don't really have anything, any like production people to do things for them or whatever. It's all kind of ad hoc. Of yeah, you're a journalist, so think, do what you want, enjoy, sort of thing. Yeah. So it was like, I think he said to them, um, these guys will do one with me and they can, they can sort out the production of it and stuff. 
and hosting it and all that kind of stuff. Because I know, I know Phil did one at the YEP, but I think he wanted someone to host it and provide a bit of structure to it and all that sort of stuff. So yeah, they they came to us and they, well, they essentially paid Dan to put it together and put the audio files out and stuff. And then I am on it as well. So fair enough. It's, yeah. Uh, yeah, but it's good. It's a really nice thing for us to do. Like we we've had Phil on a, a couple of hours in the past, but it's. I think Phil doesn't. He sometimes doesn't realize quite how much he knows. Like you can talk about absolutely anything, and he'll have a little story or a bit of an insight about you know some random left back we had in 2009 or something. He just he just knows things from from being around for such a long time. And I think now he's fairly well connected with the club. I'm not sure if that's he's always been had necessarily such close ties to it, but I think now the club will speak fairly open with him on stuff. So if, if things are coming from him, you kind of know they're fairly they're on fairly solid terms normally. With the uh, Yorkshire Evening Post, I think they still do that one, but like, I think it's got Graham Smith and Joe Worker on it, and from what I can tell from the audio and things that Graham has said at points, it sounds like it's effectively filmed in a cupboard or like a side room. So there's yeah, yeah, it, you you can tell there's not a dedicated studio there. I don't think they invested much in it at all, which was a bit of a shame because it had potential to, be, and it still does have potential, I think, to be quite big, but. Like Phil said, they used to just record it on the phone. Like it wasn't; they didn't even have microphones, and you know, it's not, it's not that expensive to get some equipment set up. I mean, we've now got quite a bit of stuff because we've been doing it for a while. But you can buy like a, a thing called a Rodecaster. I don't know if you've seen it, but it's kind of a, a specialist bit of podcast equipment, which has got it's got all like noise gates and um, compressors and stuff like that built in like so the sort of stuff you get in a bigger radio station but it's got all that kind of stuff built in and inputs four mics, records straight onto an SD card, it's like it's just a really simple way of doing it and you know they could probably have invested like 600 quid in one of them and I'd had it sounding quite good but to let them do it on the phones in a room that's not at all sound treated or anything it's a bit it's a bit shoddy to be honest yeah. but we've got film now so who cares yeah. it, 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 so it limits them a bit and I feel like that's a bit of a shame because in terms of like under 23's experts. I, th- I think Joe Urquhart goes to like all of the matches. Mm. So hearing him talk about them is like, ah, oh, that's quite interesting. I didn't know that. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I occasionally watch the 23's, but that's mostly to see what our new fancy Brazilian signing is doing. Yeah, I must admit, it's, it's quite nice having the under 23's on YouTube now. I think particularly now, because they're quite often pleasure in the day and because I'm doing this full time, like if I do tend to watch them now, whereas it was kind of harder to well, they weren't on a lot of the time, and if even if they were, it was sort of harder to get away with watching them at your desk when you're meant to be doing an actual job, just having it sort of minimised in the corner in case anyone's watching. Uh, but and and it's good to watch as well. Like it's actually there's some quite exciting players in there now as well. I really like the look of Gelhart and Greenwood when I've seen them, and occasionally there's other ones in there as well. Like that, I can't remember which game it was. It might have been the Sunderland one. I can't remember, but there was like. Um, Guy called Niall Huggins was playing in that, and he just stood out. I'd never really seen him or heard much of him before, but just seeing people like that in in these games and getting a first glimpse of him was quite exciting. It reminds me of, you know, the almost the good old days of being in the Premier League again, and you'd occasionally go and watch the reserves, and you'd get you'd get to see the next big thing in playing in those teams. It feels like there is now a bit of a bit of proper talent coming through. Well, coming through or nicked from Wigan, depending on how you want to view it. Nick from Wigan or an Arsenal off cut. W- one exactly. of them, yeah. Uh, the, I've got a bunch of questions that I asked uh, Gary when I did the interview a few days ago, but I think they'll suit you. Um, as a proud Yorkshireman, there's a few questions that everyone from Yorkshire should have their own answers for. Mm. Uh, so, first question, Harrogate, good or bad? It's all right. It's Harrogate, I suppose. It's not... Um, I'm trying to think. I've been a few times. Years ago, when I was going out with a, a Peruvian girl who'd come over to England, and we went out. We stayed in Harrogate for a night, and I can't remember. We've been to like a couple of bars and stuff. Went into some takeaway, and a massive fight broke out, and um, someone ended up getting their head kicked in, and it was all a bit, a bit weird. And then years later, I found myself back in Harrogate, and in the same kebab shop, and I said to my mate, last time I was in here, a big fight broke out, and, and then it happened again. I mean, like about 10 years apart. The uh, it, So, Harrogate, good for kebab shop fighting, is what I've uh, what I've learned over the years. Um, I don't so think I'm they're going to put it on the signs, though. I don't think that's quite what they're going to be using. 
But I'm going to say good because of the kebab shop fighting. It's it's on a it's as good as Wakefield, I would say, for that. That's a high bar. Kebab shop fights alongside Wakefield. <laughs> yep. Right. Um, favorite bit of the county for a nice walk. And you can't just say North Yorkshire. That's cheating. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm going to go. I'm going to go west. Actually, I'm going to go like Halifax, Hebden Bridge, sort of way over there. Um, my well, my, my grandparents from Northern Ireland actually, but they lived in Halifax, and that's where my mum grew up. So I kind of spent quite a bit of my my childhood over there. So yeah, like it over that way. I'd I've, I'm kind of Pontefract, so I'm out the other way. But I would I, I do like the hills. I might move out that way at some point. That's a good show. When because I have to go between Leeds and Lancashire via the train quite a lot. Um, that stop at Heaven Bridge is always the nicest one. Uh, yeah. Thank you for the follow, by the way, Digital Laxative. What a name that is. Fair enough. Um, where was I up to? Oh, there it is. Um, what is banned from a Sunday roast? Um, ketchup. The girl I used to work with, who was from Cumbria, so you've got to allow for certain certain quirks, but she didn't like gravy and used to have ketchup on a Sunday roast. Uh, I didn't even consider ketchup because it's that outlandish to put on a Sunday roast. I suppose I wouldn't have done either if it, if it wasn't for her. So, um, Sarah Mannix, you're sicko. Uh, we've got another question from uh, just splitting up the... Yorkshireman questions from Jay Hazeltine. Have you been playing any more Football Manager? Any recurring head injuries? If you remember that from your live stream, I didn't I see this. It was it was a mate of mine said that he used to um, he used to go into the editor and give David Beckham a fractured skull with a one hundred percent chance of recurring, <laughs> so he would be permanently uh, <laughs> cracked. Um, I have played it a bit since I've. Been, I mean, we've been playing the 01, 02 version a bit on the on the podcast, and I've I have had a game going on the just the latest version as well, where I started as Geisley, then I went to Reading, and then I'm at Southampton. But I haven't played that in a few weeks, but I was I was trying to work my way up from the bottom. Got Geisley to League One, then the the incredible glamour of Reading came calling, so I I went there and then got I got them up and then got the Southampton job, and I'm doing I'm doing all right there. Fair enough. Um, Digital Laxative is not only excellently named, but he has a question. Uh, what's your favourite boozer in Ponty, Frank? Ponty? Um, probably the Robin Hood, I would say. Tap and Barrel's quite nice too, although I think, I think that's just... I've not been in because of lockdown and all that, but that's just changed hands just before lockdown, I think, so I'm not sure. There's there's a couple of little pubs open now as well. Like There's one that looks quite nice that it, it was meant to be opening, but it didn't because of... Um, because of our lockdown and stuff, I think it's called the is it called Prince's Draft or something. It looks like, like it'd be quite nice. So I quite like a small pub in general. There's a few massive ones in Ponty as well, which I always feel a bit a bit terrifying and empty. Although there's um there's also a, a pub called the Elephant, which is just brilliant for how strange it is. There's like it's one of those ones that has karaoke on in the afternoon and stuff, so it's got a slight three legs vibe to it. Fair enough. Um, I'm sure you, because you've got the stream open, may have seen the question that's just come in. Any chance of a Ken Bates appearance? <laughs> oh, Ken. I feel... I... It, it, most people are disgusted by the Ken. So I'm impressed by it's, it. It's, no, it's not, it's not di that difficult to do. The, sort of, it's very mouthy. You've got to get a lot of... If you get like a, a bit of drink... And you've got to like, hold it in your mouth. So, that makes it spill. But you're going to put the action. It's not that easy. So, if I was to smile, Coca Cola would run down my face. But, as it is, it, it's all nicely stored just in my bottom lip. And you get, part of the, the beauty of having a good microphone is that you can pick up all of them. All of the noises. My mouth noises that Susanna gets to hear when I'm when I'm in her ear on an evening having a little go on her. It's a real treat. I don't think I've that. ever been so horrified. <laughs> then I'm not. Oh no! <laughs> Sorry about that. 
Um, I spoke to um, the guy who does um, the LS11 podcast. Is Darren Harper used to be on the Bates radio station, and I was asking him about uh, about Ken, and he said that by the end he used to do these interviews, and he, he used to send them the questions to ask him. And he was saying basically by the end they didn't used to put them on air; they used to just um, they used to stick it out on the website. So he thought he'd gone out, but they didn't broadcast them because it was too long and rambling for for. <laughs> sort of public <laughs> consumption they used to try and hide it away as much as possible while imagine, have him still believing it was going out imagine writing your own propaganda broadcasts and still being so shit they don't go out <laughs> <laughs> i know i think he actually i think he was all right to work for as well though i think he actually paid people fairly well yeah. which was um yeah kind of kind of strange but he's um he, he shut that place down really rapidly as well which i think he did shut on people but at the end he kind of he, he pulled the plug on them and said, "Pretty much, get out of there straight away." So, it's, I mean, if you're working with Ken Bates, it's not really a great surprise that you're going to get you're going to get shot on at some point, is it? Not in the slightest, to be honest. No, um, we seem to be hitting a bit of a Ken Bates section. Um, have you been keeping track of um, Wyoming, or has he still got everyone blocked? Uh, the Facebook, yeah, I still I keep an eye on. I think it's called Oil City News is the website. Um, so I do go on that occasionally to keep up, up to date with the news in Wyoming. And you can watch, it's, it's mental I'm doing this really, you can you can watch like their live uh, council meetings and stuff and watch them back over after the event and stuff. So I'm going back occasionally to see if Ken says anything interesting so we can put it on the podcast. But he rarely does. He doesn't speak very much and it's, it's quite often just quite boring council business. So... I'll keep an eye on him. Um, I think he's due for re-election fairly soon, so maybe we'll try and try and get behind him there. As someone with two politics degrees, the idea of doing that is a nightmare even to me. So, I mean, congrats to you. Fair enough. Um, there was on the interview that I did with Gary Brennan. He discussed a point where he won a raffle with the club, and this might be a fairly good villainy nomination. Uh, but he got invited to have uh, lunch and watch a match in the director's box, featuring a buffet with Ken Bates. Um, it turns out he put some fairly crap buffets, uh, featuring a mishmash of foods that don't go together in the slightest, including watercress soup, uh, thin sliced ham, um, I think it was jerk chicken or like chicken quarters or something, couscous. I can't remember what else was on there. I'm sure someone in the chat remembers from the interview earlier, but yeah, a dodgy food taste if you're running out of things for this week. There was there was once a picture emerged of something Ken had had at the ground. It was, I think it was a private dinner or something that he'd had. I think and... it was him, because he said that he got confused for a member of like a buying consortium or something. Oh, whole prawns is what the chat is telling me. Um, whole prawns that you had to like snap open yourself and like remove the tail and the spine and stuff like that, which oh, doesn't okay. quite go with thin sliced ham, in my opinion. Uh, but yeah, what, what were you saying about the um, private dinner stuff? Oh, yeah, a picture emerged of what had been served, and it was a it was a suckling pig with a pineapple up his ass. <laughs> um, I, I've got the picture somewhere. It's all in like the, the Bates files that, that I'm going to submit to the authorities at some point, but I mean, I also had I've had a dinner paid for by Ken Bates, essentially, because I won. I won the place in his box when he used to give away give it away from uh, Yorkshire Radio or Radio Yorkshire. I can't remember what which version it was by then, but he used to do a competition, and I think it was on the on the podcast. I was like, surely no one's entering this. No one listens to this radio station. I bet if I enter, I'll win. And the first week I entered, I won, so I went in. Um, should, should have tried the next week then. Gradually well, grow up a friendship. Someone, someone from my work did, and they they entered for the first time the week after, and they won as well. So it was it was not particularly difficult. Ken wasn't in there, sadly. Uh, it was um, it was Darren Harper, in fact. From it weirdly in that in the box on that evening was Darren Harper, who knows Dallas Eleven, and me, and then Gary Devonport, who does Talking Shut. He won a place in there as well, which I think he'd I think he'd heard on Square Ball saying people should enter this, you'll probably win. So, so he entered that and he definitely won. So he entered that and he definitely won. But I put um, 
like baits out stickers all over the box and like on the underside of the tables, on the chairs, on the bog seats. I just every flat surface I could find, I, I had like coat pockets absolutely rammed full of these stickers that I just put over everything I could find. Um, and then I left. But it's the night we beat Bournemouth 1 0. So it was actually, it was actually an all right day. But I think that was a weird food as well. I'm sure the starter was like samosas and onion barges, but then it was followed by chicken in white wine sauce or something it didn't make any sense it not it not been thought through properly it felt like someone was clearing out a freezer there's there's definitely something wrong with his mouth if he speaks like that and eats like that some something's not going right in that area i'm not too sure what it is but maybe he needs his gut as well he's a big man i'm amazed he's not dead to be honest but maybe he's eating that much he gets confused about what certain foods taste like Yeah, he lives in Monaco. No one ever dies in Monaco. I'll get onto that later. That's a conversation for a few minutes' time. Um, so back on the Yorkshire questions, because never mind, there has been another question in the chat. Uh, who's worse, Bates, Chilino, or Ridsdale? Uh, Bates. I think. I think for what I, I mean to cover him off, I think Ridsdale was went mental and paid himself a really big salary while spending money that wasn't his. But I think at, at the end of it, he did actually want us to be good. Chilino was in some ways, I think he wanted us to be good as well, but he had, he was so far out of his depth and he thought he could run us like a small Italian club where you could tell the players to bring in a packed lunch and it'd be fine. And it just was never going to happen. And the level of expectation at Leeds was not something he could ever deal with. He deserves maybe a bit of credit because he, well, he deserves both both credit and complete disdain for the way he didn't look at any books before he came in and was sold a complete shack of a, a shambles of a club by GFH who had stripped any money that Bates hadn't already stripped out. They'd stripped out further. So what he bought was completely riddled with debts and, but he didn't do any proper due diligence, so he, he got shafted on that. But I think Bates, for the systematic way that he downsized us and caused and deliberately caused infighting between fans and just ran the club down and tried to run expectations down to the extent that we were meant to be grateful to him for getting us relegated twice and putting us into administration and all that sort of stuff. I think, and for the longevity and the years over which he did it, I think he wins because of that. It yeah, to, the right word. to to do it that effectively for that long, that takes the the other two. I think you can attribute to incompetence with him. It's it's got to be a deep seated malice somewhere down there. Yeah, I mean, Chilino had bits of malice in it when he did like the pie tax stuff, and because people were singing about him. Um, but he was just an idiot. Like he's doing it now, and he's 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 kind of saying, "Oh, I'll sell the club. I'll give it away. I don't want to." And when the COVID hit the first time, he was saying, oh, we should never play again. The football should end. And he just, he wants to, the first sign of trouble, Chilino wants to just down tools and leave. But then he realizes he can't because it's where he earns his money from. So we get that strange, strange thing by on a, on a morning, he wants to, uh, he wants to just throw it all off in the bin and go home. And then in the afternoon, he realizes he's got quite an expensive lifestyle and that needs to be paid for somehow. Um. Back on the Yorkshire questions, because we've not got one in the chat for a while. Um, Toad in the hole, is it worth the sacrifice Yorkshire put in? Yeah, it's not sacrificed, is it? I think it's a bit sacrificed. I'm, I'm, I've ne never really been a fan of Toad in the hole, because it feels like you're never going to get like a crispy sausage. Uh, I think I never cook it, I have to say. I have no objections to it. Would you would you do your sausages separate and just drop them in the middle with gravy? I think would, so. Would that, be, would that be a reasonable compromise? I think that's a good compromise. It, it's my same issue with pasta bake. When you cook like a sausage in a pasta bake, you just get a wet sausage. Mm. You, you, you need a bit of crunch in there, you know? <laughs> no, no wet sausages. Wet sausages are banned in this stream. Um... Your favourite post Premier League relegation manager with Bielsa and Grayson banned from being answers because that's basically cheating. God, slim pickings apart from those two. Um, God, who have we got? Not Blackwell because he was a dick. Definitely not Wise. I mean, I quite. 
liked McAllister as a bloke. He seemed all right. Quite like Thomas Christensen. Neil, Red, Neil Redfern probably deserves it, actually, just for the amount of times he did it and for sticking around as long as he did. He did, he did quite well with the youngsters as well. He brought, he brought through some good players for a sub. Yeah, probably Redfern, I guess. Yeah, I, I've personally got a soft spot for Christensen, but that's because that was the point where I'd started to like care a little bit more about watching Leeds mm. because I'd gone to uni in like 2016 and at that point it was very easy to be completely disconnected from football because you're living on a campus where you've not got a TV and it's very easy to just sort of like slip into this abyss of pop culture mm. so I, that was the point where I started like watching again although the first match I watched was the one where Samu Sai spat on someone and got a nine match ban yeah. So maybe that was a sign I should have given up already. But yeah, I've, I've got a little bit of a soft spot for Christensen. He seems like a I nice thought... bloke if he's not the best manager. Yeah, I thought he, I thought he seemed all right, and he was, he had quite an interesting backstory as well. Which when we, when you've had a lot of English managers in the past who have maybe not been particularly interesting, it was quite nice to have someone who'd, who was kind of, a, was Spanish, but then had played in Germany but wasn't actually Spanish even though he played for him and he, I don't know he, did, he felt like he, he had something about him as well as a squeaky voice which I quite enjoyed he's got a bit of pizzazz rather than being a PE teacher yeah I think so yeah. and, it, and it was and it was good we it did seem for a brief period about seven games that we were going to go up under him so it was nice to have that bit of hope I think that little space weird how those little spells actually I think partly brought about Bielsa maybe because it, it changed the mindset of fans. We were like, it's nice winning games. I'm in top of the league. We should do this more. After years of finishing like 15th, it was nice to have that little reminder. I think it, while it is hysterical what's happening to him at Sheffield Wednesday, Monk deserves some credit for that as well for the, the season we had with him because that was a one that it kind of breathed a bit of life into us because after so many years of just being mid-table, even though he didn't ultimately get in the playoffs, just having it, having it there was, uh, it just dangled in front of us, made it feel like it maybe one day would be possible again. So, but yeah, I, I'm not giving it to Gary Monk, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna give it to Redders. It is quite like funny. Did. It is quite funny to watch Sheffield Wednesday right now and just their position in the table. I'm not quite sure where it is at the moment. It's probably still bottom. Are they still in negative it's, points? They've got minus four points. Didn't we? So that's not great. Didn't we clear 15 points in five matches? We did indeed. And they're and about nine in or something, and they've not... And they've only got eight off their debt, which yep. is... It's a little bit sad, that, isn't it? Lost to Wickham today as well, who were not... With the greatest respect to them, obviously, if you're in there, you deserve to be there, but they're not a championship team, are they? So it's, uh, no, they're not... it makes it all the funnier. Yeah, when you've got a player that is known more for his size than his footballing ability, and I can fend we're up top... And yeah. you're losing to the team that do that. It's not a great look, is it? Is he still there, Akin Fenner? Has he gone yeah. this summer? I watched still the there. Wickham Watford match because it's nice sometimes to look back on the championship <laughs> and think, oh, we're not here anymore. That's quite nice. And uh, yeah, he, watching him against Ben Foster was a bit funny. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's all, it works for him, doesn't it? It's, um, but he's, he's very odd to watch. He's a ludicrous size. If it works out, it works out. Can't, yeah. yeah. You, you can't begrudge him it, to be honest. No, and he seems like a quite a quite a good guy to have about the place as well. So I think I think people quite like what he brings to the dressing room and all that stuff. Uh, Hib one thousand and two has a question. Uh, why did Oddie leave the pod podcast? This was a bit before I started listening. So take the wheel. Um, he, he left for a couple of reasons. Uh, partly. One of his daughters was doing loads of gymnastics, which is a dead boring, boring thing to say. But he, she just required taking places all the time, like on evenings and stuff. He'd had to take her to, like, I think Harrogate was one of the places he had to go quite regularly with her. Um, and also, he didn't say much. So he said, like, oh, it's fine. Just do it without me. I don't speak much anyway. Um, and it's true. He didn't, he didn't speak as much as the rest of us. So uh, he decided to, to jack it in. He did reappear on the promotion one that we did for, live from the Broodnell. If you, It's on YouTube, is that if anyone wants to... Yeah, I, I, see, see Oddie in the flesh. See, he does still exist. 
I, I gave that one a listen and I was like, I have no idea who this person is, but they sound like <laughs> they're friends with each other, so that's quite nice. <laughs> You know, Oddish, he's stayed involved with everything else though. Like, um, he's he's always been involved in the mag stuff, and he sorts out things for merchandise and accounts and all sorts of that that kind of stuff. So yeah, he's uh, and he's always there. To, if there's me and another bloke quite often hanging around the Lowfields Tunnel with boxes and magazines. He is the the other bloke who people will see. So um, yeah, he's uh, he's still very much around, just not on the podcast. So uh, the last question under the Yorkshire chunk, um, which is the pessimist you are, I'm not too sure what you're going to answer. Where do Leeds finish this year? Hmm. In fact, start of the season. Yeah, I was going to say, what would be your guess at the start of the season, and what would it be now? The start of the season, I'd have said like thirteenth, fourteenth, but the way it's gone, tenth. Ninth, something like that. I think we'll we might have a bit of a Sheffield United last season season where at points we'll look like we're maybe threatening to get into Europe, but then we might have the odd run of injuries or something, and we'll just fade away. But that's absolutely fine. I can anything. I just my hope for the season was that we wouldn't have to get caught up in any proper relegation battles. Like what happened to Villa last year. I just didn't want anything like that. I wanted us to be clear of it for the for the duration and. I think are we still like nine? Are we nine points clear of relegation now, as uh, it stands? Because it's something. I remember looking last week and thinking it was really funny that um, Scum were only in sixteenth, but they were still five points clear of relegation because the bottom four were incredibly shit. Yeah, yeah. With the bottom one or three two points got, each. Yeah, Sheffield United, Fulham, and Burnley have both got have all got a point each. So, we're, so we're nine points clear of relegation as it stands, and if we could stay. Nine points all season. That'd be that'd be just fine by me. That'd be pretty nice. I feel like one of those teams might break the derby record this year because it's watching any of those teams play is potentially the worst thing that I've ever tried to watch. I think it was Burnley West Brom I tried watching. I was just I can't do this. I think if Fulham keep Scott Parker, they've a reasonable chance of, of breaking Derby's record. They should have sacked him last year. Like the team they had in the championship should have it should have easily. He was better than West Brom's squad by a distance, I'd say. Um, and it's not probably the worst team in this league either, but hes I don't think he's good enough. But it's great that they're keeping him, and I hope they continue to do it. It's its the same with Solskjaer. Like I, weirdly, I would be quite happy to lose like 1-0 to Man United if it meant that Solskjaer kept his job for longer. Mm. Because it gives us some like like nice prolonged entertainment. Yeah, it, it, I'd rather he didn't beat us. But like when they're winning Europe and stuff, as long as they don't actually win any cups, that's fine. Like they can beat Paris in Europe, that's good because you can't sack someone after that. And it, they, it, they can it have the League Cup as well. Long. That doesn't matter. I suppose they can. Um, but yeah, it is nice to see them not being anywhere near the top anymore. It's uh, it's one of those things that I felt like my whole life I would just have to watch them the best team and now they're absolutely nowhere near it so it's uh, it's nice but I think the danger is that they do have some good players now and if they got a good manager they probably could be good again fairly soon so hopefully Solskjaer will stay long enough that the good players get pissed off and demand to leave uh, A couple more chat questions, are there any particular goals you want to achieve with the square ball? Uh, I think we've kind of to an extent like in going full time on it, we've kind of done it because, like, it was one of those things that when we first started a magazine, we thought it was impossible. Like, there was not, there would just never ever be enough money in it that would pay even one person's a minimum wage kind of salary for a year. So to have got, you know, a few of us managing to do it on a on a full time basis, admittedly not exactly earning very much, but earning enough to to get by on. That was that was kind of more than I could have ever hoped to achieve on it. I just hope we can we can keep keep building on it and hopefully keep talking about a good football team. It's, it's kind of what, what we always hoped for with it was that we'd we'd one day actually be able to talk about football and you know get away from Steve Evans and having to look at his uh, Dave Hockaday's record at Forest Green and stuff like that. Like it's. We've to be in the Premier League and doing it full time is like incredible. I can't, as much as I've been a bit of a miserable bastard through um, 
through lockdown and stuff incredibly lucky to be able to do this as a as a job now like it's it's ridiculous it's one of those things that at school if someone had said you can talk about leads as a job you would have and occasionally played a bit of champ manager you'd have been like that's that's surely an impossible thing no one can do that as a job um and at the time i guess you wouldn't have been able to because podcasts didn't exist but um yeah to be able to do it is is brilliant like i'm I'm thrilled. I know at some point it'll probably come to an end. I'll have to get a proper job. And I always have a slight fear of uh, like someone coming along and do something better or got a bit of imp- like imposter syndrome about the whole thing where, you know, you're thinking this, how are we getting away with this kind of thing? Like surely someone should be doing a better job than this. We're not, we're not, our, we're not acceptable people to be doing this. Um, but it's it's all right so far so i'm just gonna, I'm just gonna it's, try and... it's worked out for now gotta hope it works out for longer yeah just gotta just try to enjoy it while we while we can because it's um like i say it's a dream job yeah. uh, another chat question uh which is funnier i'm rephrasing this one a bit the demise of forest or sheffield wednesday <laughs> um probably forest this year although chris hewton's gone there now hasn't he Honestly, I've got no idea. I've completely think, lost track of the championship. I think they've got Chris Hewton, who I actually quite like, but I, f- I found it hysterical all the, the when they beat us last year and they were coming to chase us down when the restart happened and things. And then I think it was only a couple of weeks ago they actually overtook our pre-lockdown points total because they completely exploded. And the way they managed to drop out of the playoffs on the last day last year was phenomenal. Like they they had to just not lose by I can't remember what it was. it was, they had to not lose by four goals or something and they managed if, to do it which is... Yeah, if I remember right, it was like a goal difference swing of six or something like that and they lost by three and I think it was Swansea, Swansea. won by two or three, yeah. And I, I I was in Discord with a couple of my mates watching the Leeds match and throughout it we were just checking the live scores and we were just like, oh Forrest are down another one. <laughs> oh, Swansea have scored. That's Forrest yeah, gone. So, so I got a lot of satisfaction from that, I think. I mean, Sheffield Wednesday is kind of... When you're getting into points deductions and things, I sometimes feel sorry for clubs, but theirs is for um, trying to spend too much money and break rules in a way that... I know when we, It feels like our point deduction we got for breaking rules was breaking rules that fucked us, and it didn't help. It's not that like we got any advantage from it particularly because we still had Ken Bates in charge and we still were spending no money, whereas Sheffield Wednesday... I don't think it, even, it was even the tip of the iceberg, the stuff they got charged for. They've got all sorts of weird things like adverts for companies that don't exist around the stadium and they make their own kit as well as having their own... Um, it's being sponsored by their own company. I think, I think the kit brand is their own thing and they pay, for, they pay themselves. There's loads of weird sort of connected companies all putting money into Sheffield Wednesday, so... Um, yeah, I, th- I think there's something like a taxi company or something, if I remember right, that they pay tens of thousands of pounds to move the players about, which all seems a little bit suspicious. Yeah, it sounds like Pablo Escobar type stuff, somehow ta- dodgy taxi companies. So uh, I'm pleased to see them taking a bit of punishment. And there were those there were those times as well where they looked like they were spending a load of money and might go up and we were still kind of languishing in 15th so the fact they didn't escape and now they have to take the medicine is quite quite nice to watch although i would truth be told i'd quite like Sheffield wednesday in the premier league because i think my version of what the premier league should be is very set on like the mid 90s when i started getting into football so i just want that back and that involves Sheffield wednesday so i'll have them let them take the medicine for a bit and maybe go down to league one but then we'll have them in the premier league in a few years I see. I've got the early 2000s look. I'm confused as to why Sunderland and Blackburn aren't in there myself. Yeah, I'd, I'd, in fairness, I'd have them. I'd have... I mean, Blackburn, I think, of winning the league. I, that's one of my first scenes of being beat majorly into football was them winning the league. So, And they beat Scum, which always gave me a bit of a soft spot for them. Um, Sunderland, I think of as a bit of a yo-yo team. So they're allowed in every, like, two years out of three, they can be in the Premier League. Not League One. That's not where you tend to expect them. No, I feel a bit sorry for them. They're a bit like us at Sunderland at the moment, like a, a lad who used to work with supports them, and I kind of see his stuff he puts on Facebook and on Twitter and stuff, and it's it's very much the 
it just reminds me of our plight in League One, where it feels like you're just going from one ship manager to another, and even when you get a good run together, it then soon enough goes tits up, and then you sell your best player, and then there's talk of a takeover that never happens, and it just it is a horrible it is a horrible place to be down there. So they they do deserve better, but again, they probably thought it was funny when we were down there. So let them let them have so a bit. It's of funny time, when there. I'd let them out now. They've done the time. Three years in League One's enough for anyone. Swap them with Wickham. That'll do it. Yeah, Wickham. Bless them. I've seen Leeds win at Wickham. I think. I think Becchio scored from outside the box. I seem to remember. Quite a day. It was quite a good day. Uh, JWB asks uh, thoughts on the first Premier League manager sacked. Ooh, probably Scott Parker. I think he's probably only got one more defeat in him and then he'll have to go. I can't think, I think, I mean, Wilder won't get sacked at Sheffield when uh, Sheffield United, I don't think Deitch will go. I think Lampard's probably got a little bit longer left in him. Solskjaer's doing all right in Europe, so that'll see him hang on. So yeah, I think I think Parker's probably a safe bet. And I think the Fulham's chairman's come out and said a few things. Hasn't, hasn't he like apologised for defeats and things recently, which is always a, mm. that always is a bit of an indication that He's he's not entirely happy with how things are going, so yeah, I think probably probably Parker. Yeah, I would agree with the person in chat about Billich being a candidate, but I've heard things like oh, that's true. Billich potentially wanting to leave because they were selling players that he didn't want to sell or something like that. Yeah, he might just walk as well if he's if he decides he's he's not worth it because I get the feeling Billich is like. It's maybe not a hothead's probably the wrong word for it, but I think he's the sort of bloke who might get in an argument and storm out one day if something if something pisses him off. Yeah. So I quite I quite like Billich to be honest. It's it, it's sort of the same situation that we've got with Bielsa, except West Brom don't seem to treat Billich with the same sort of want of key keeping him. Yeah, yeah. I feel like as well with Billich, I think that that squad it was a perfectly good championship squad, but I didn't I did see when they came up that I thought they'd probably struggle to to stay up without investing heavily. And when you look at, I know we've, we've spent quite a lot, but not as much as some teams when they come up, but I think we've invested quite wisely and put some, some good quality players in around some others who were, who were probably able to take the step up in a way that, you know, with the best will in the world, Kyle Bartley probably isn't as much as I loved him when he was with us. Yeah. On the um, us investing thing, I still have that massive worry that were two injuries were ailing and Dallas away from being broken entirely. Which is a little bit terrifying, because that would leave us with Alioski at left back and no right back. Um, Yeah, who does play right back? Shackleton, he can go there. Ish, um, sort of. Ish. Yeah, it's, but then it's weird, because I was thinking this the other week when because I, I didn't when we when the Quisons thing fell through, I thought, ah, oh, well, we don't we don't really need another central, central midfielder. Then Phillips got injured. And you you sort of think, oh, okay, maybe maybe I've been a bit hasty. And then, but then you saw against Villa, strike had to go off, and I think it was the right decision to take him off because he he did look like he was he was one tackle away from a red. And you'd think that would cause us problems, but actually, he all just he all just slotted into place. Mm-hmm. I think uh, I don't know. Dallas and Dallas and Ailey are, are very important to us, and I think I think it's the system that overrides the individuals at the moment for us and hopefully someone else will be able to slot in. I mean, we saw last year when Ale- when Aleoski has filled in at left back and um, even when I've seen bits of Leif Davis and stuff, it's, it, it'd be interesting to see if, if one of someone like that would be able to step into the team and, you know, potentially make a, make the place their own if they had a decent run of, of games in there. I guess right back. Yeah, I'd not thought of that. I suppose the thinking at right back is that Dallas covers both and... Alioski goes to the left back, but if they're both out at the same time, yeah, I'm not. I'm not quite sure what you do. Um, I think with Davis, it's similar to Shackleton. What they tend to do is run a lot, and by moving into the Premier League, you've not lost their ability to run quite a lot. Which, yeah, and seeing as he runs very fast quite a lot, I don't see Davis having too many issues moving up until he needs to do like lots of defensive stuff. Yeah. I, I I've got a reasonable amount of faith in him. If if Bielsa likes him, which he clearly does, then I think he's probably good enough. I think I, I've not yet seen 
I'm trying to think if there's anyone actually that's going to disprove this. I'm not sure if there's anyone that Bielsa has faith in that I doubt anymore. I think in at certain points in the early days, I'd maybe would have looked at someone like Dallas, who he really liked, and I wasn't quite sure if he was good enough. But then he's he's just got better and better, and he's now arguably our most important player. So I think he sees things in players and and he's able to develop them. It's like when he when he first came to the club, he saw enough in videos of Phillips and Cooper and people like that to say that he can make them brilliant, and and he has so. He knows what he's doing. It's nice to have a manager in charge who you can kind of go, well, if he says that, I'm happy Fair to go enough, along with yeah. it. Let him go Whereas when, it. when Heckingbottom or someone was doing things, you, you were quite rightly second-guessing everything they were doing because it was, you could see it wasn't working. So, and it hadn't worked in the past, whereas Bielsa has now got so much credit in the bank that if he decides he wants to you know, play Jamie Shackleton at, at left-back from now on, I'd probably be like, well, sure he's got his reasons, but let, let him crack on with it, see where we are in six months. Uh, Jay Heseltine says what well, I basically agree with. If Bielsa's happy, I'm happy. Uh, thank you, Danny Redican, for donating £10. Uh, we need to have a catch-up at some time, by the way. I know him from uni. Um, Papa Fleming likes the fact that we can buy our players in fantasy football. What are your little unexpected pleasures of being in the top flight? Um, I think it is weirdly stuff like that. I've just seen more Leeds stuff around the place. Like the the fact that we are not a footnote anymore, and I think it's nice to not have the discussion around Leeds has changed in a way that, that is just refreshing to hear. Because for so many years that you'd only ever hear Leeds discussed are uh, in a, in context of are they on the way back or how bad is this crisis? It's nice to now for people to be to just hear us talked about and people are talking about how we're good at football again, as opposed to oh are, are Leeds going to blow it? Can they? You know what? What's going to happen to Bielsa? Is he going to quit? Is who do they get next? Are they going to sell this player for to this Premier League club? It's all completely changed now, and it feels like we're going to have the luxury of uh, like going into a January transfer window where we're going to be probably looking to buy someone rather than just trying to keep hold of someone. And that whole the whole framing of of leads in the media has changed and I think that's nice. I've got so used to it be it being the way it was that it was just about us struggling and our the fact we were a sleeping giant and that we were never going to get out and that we were falling apart and all that sort of a narrative that had built up over the years that just having us discussed in, in nice football terms just feels it feels like a weight's been lifted in a way. Just the the noise of that every every single week on TV and the radio just made just sort of wore me down over the years. But it's um I've just seen in the chat there someone's just put a no more Don Goodman and no more Don Goodman is in, is indeed a nice a nice surprise. Uh, for me, the uh, match of the day bit is a big thing because, like mm. I, as as I mentioned, it was like the day that we went down is my first football memory. So us being on match of the day for the first time in my like conscious life was a really weird experience. It's like. Mm. I know you from talking about football, but why are you talking about the football that I watch? It makes no sense. Yeah. I think that sort of stuff's important for... Less so for me, because I'm kind of of an age where I'm, I'm bought into it anyway, and I'll, f I'll find leads where I, you know, wherever they are on TV or the internet or whatever. But for, for any kids who maybe... Like, like even local kids who maybe whose families aren't massively into football but might be stumbling across things on TV, if they can see Leeds playing on a normal channel and not have to go to Quest or seek out a stream or of, our, of us playing away at, um, you know, at Huddersfield or something. It's just that, that the way that you'll come across Leeds in a pack of like stickers or whatever or on FIFA and all that sort of thing. I think it's just, it will make a big difference for people to see that, that we're so much more present now in in the football world that I think it's, it's going to make a big difference to us. Maybe not, well, maybe not instantly, but in the next couple of years, just being around all that, it's going to be a big thing. And it's going to bring negatives as well. Cause you'll end up like, if we're good, we'll end up with like a load of glory supporters and things, but that's fine. They can come. I don't mind. I'd rather Ella Rob was full and we were, had plenty of people buying shirts and stuff. By be if we've learned anything from being in league one, it's that being small, it doesn't suit us. It just means you end up with 20,000 really pissed off people as opposed to like 40,000 happy ones. Yeah. 
With the making sure Ellen Road is full, but I remember the past two years, I think, where the only football matches I've been able to watch have been like League Cup third round games against Preston and I can't remember who the other one was, but like not very good football games and not very good football mm-hmm. teams with like three of our first eleven playing. And even that was like the match. It it was where. Um, there was a penalty shootout at the end of it and Jack Harrison hit the post and everyone was still really happy about it. Mm. I can't remember to- Stoke, that's the one. Yeah. That and th- 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 there were still like 20 odd thousand people in there and it's like, this game doesn't matter. The fact that I've struggled to get tickets to a football match that doesn't matter mm. is great, but at the same time I really want to watch Leeds at Elland Road sometimes. Yeah, it, it's it's weird the way that's flipped of you know, now all of a sudden a season ticket has a value of being able to get a ticket for every game, whereas for years it was more or less a convenience thing and you saved a little bit of money, but it's like, well, you know, you can walk up on the day and get a ticket for, for a Leeds game. There's there's 20,000 spares there if you want them. And the the difference of towards the end of the hecking bottom era, I went on holiday and I missed a game and trying to give away my season ticket to someone was really difficult, trying to be like, anyone want this? It's free. You just have to turn up, beep yourself in. No one would have it because everyone was like, "Nah, no, don't, don't think I wanna." Some end of season dead rubber against. I can't remember which game it was. It was the it's game a, after Barnsley? I it'll be, so, it'll be something like Hartlepool or something. <laughs> but it was like it was just a. It was just no one was interested, and all of a sudden it's it's kind of captured the imagination again, and it's it's nice. Like, I, I know some people are, get a little bit bitter about where were you and we were shit and all that sort of stuff, but. I'd, I've been in, like I say, I've been in Allen Road full and in it empty, and I know which I prefer. Uh, I'm going to move on, because I don't think there's any questions, to the next uh, sort of segmenty bit, and I'm going to drop in, like, chat questions in the middle. Uh, this was inspired by a bit of university, and it is entitled Shit Questions from Philosophy Seminars. <laughs> it's the sort of thing that I think you'd expect. Um, the first one, obviously... Do we have free will, and does it matter? Um, no, I don't think we necessarily do. Um, and it doesn't matter hugely because uh, it depends on you're defining free will. I didn't do philosophy, so this is possibly where my um, I'm going to hit a limit of knowledge here. Are you defining free will as like to do absolutely anything you want? Yeah, to do whatever you want. Yeah, I mean, obviously you can't do that, but that's I wouldn't say that's necessarily so important because I think it's more important to live in a society and accept that you've got to make allowances for other people. So don't be a dick to people, even if that means not doing what you want all the time. Wear a mask for Christ's sake. Don't be a baby. These are deliberately shit questions, and you're taking this far too seriously. <laughs> I remember in the seminar I said, it doesn't matter if I don't have free will, why are we having this argument? I can't do anything about it. And the tutor got angry at me for not taking it seriously enough. It's a fair point. Um, There was one that was one of life's impossible to answer questions. Uh, If you've never seen a pigeon corpse, are they immortal? Or is there a big pigeon graveyard? I've seen pigeon corpses. I had one... um... I hit my window once and I had to I had to put it in a bag and get it in the wheelie bin, so I can confirm. Unless it was having me on and it, it later escaped the bin, um, they do die. That was a quite sad answer to that question. I think uh, left an imprint on the window and everything. You could see its you could see its face and its wings had kind of squished uh, all all imprinted. Uh, but yeah, there it was, dead outside the window. So was sorry it? to oh, no. sorry to have uh, have break your heart there, but they do die. I mean, I've, I've I've come across seagulls that are half eaten in the middle of Blackpool, so I, I know they die. I wasn't too sure on pigeons yet, though. Eaten by who? Maybe the pigeons. Maybe they're eating each other. Maybe there's a turf war. I've been to Blackpool. It's quite a lawless town. You don't know what's going to go on there. Well, seagulls eating pigeons, and pigeons eating seagulls, apparently. Um, if there was one. Secret industry controlling the world. What would it be? The answer from the previous interview was Big Lou Roll. 
I mean, the, the serious answer is probably technology. Um, the more light-hearted answer, the uh, on a similar pasta, big pasta. Big you pasta. saw it was off the shelves. You saw it, it, it in the same as bog roll was gone at the start of lockdown. Pasta as well. The the control and the supply of it to keep the prices high. But it was only some of the pasta. I remember going myself and it was like lasagna sheets and the other crap ones that no one actually likes were still there. So like clearly big pasta's not thought this through. Mm, yeah, they do not they don't people don't realise you can break up those lasagna sheets. Make your own make your own shells. No, but then you got like shards. You got mm, shards of shards. pasta. Yeah. I like Does pasta shards to be alright. Uh, you can break them up as long as you like tagliatelle, says the chat. <laughs> I mean, you can you can cook them and then you can slice them into whatever shapes you want. That's a good point. But what if mm, I remember cooking lasagna once and it was in like a uni kitchen, so the pans were shit. Um, and I was following this recipe that required the lasagna to be cooked before like doing anything. And uh, it was a really fun situation where I had to either cook one sheet at a time, which worked just fine, or all of them at once, which meant I just had a brick of like slightly damp lasagna, which was. You're giving me that look. You've eaten my slightly damp brick of lasagna. It wasn't pleasant. No, it wasn't pleasant. So yeah, I, I, yeah, I can't really recommend lasagna as a cook it before you recipe it. I don't think I've ever pasta. tried to cook lasagna. Weirdly, I think it's just one of the things I just think ah, just have a, just do spaghetti bolognese instead. It's more straightforward. Yeah, it's wang the stuff in a pan, wang the pasta in another pan, easy. Whereas lasagna's got lasagna's like. A spag ball building. You need to put a bit more effort into it. Mm. I'm getting such weird looks right now. <laughs> who's, who's there? Uh, it's my girlfriend, Kayla. Oh, hello. I didn't realise you were... I thought you were alone. Uh, Michael says hello. Hi! There we go. Hi! <laughs> um, I'm, try I'm trying to think of what other weird questions I've got. Um, do all maps have their own innate biases? Oh... Yeah, I think they probably do. I remember seeing stuff on maps that was like oddly, um, sort of oddly visible, like cemeteries and stuff and churches. They're a bit obsessed with it. I guess it's Ordnance Survey because it's like for landmarks and stuff. But I just remember as a kid thinking, like, I've never really noticed so many cemeteries, but when you look on a map, they're always, they're always on there. I mean, Google Maps does have it as well, but that's for a more obvious, um, like algorithmic purposes it will highlight places you've been and stuff and it also grasses your purpose i was once it wasn't my choice i promise you but i was once at the end of a work night out dragged in a lap dancing bar by uh, my mate and then the next day google maps popped up on my phone and asked me to leave a review of it and yeah. it so it obviously it grasped me up it seen i got in there and it was like was it any good um and also when i got to my mum's because it's next to a pub it, it asked me to leave a review of that place as well which i'm, I'm not actually in so Yes, they do have biases. Uh, with the churches and cemeteries thing, this leads to the question of um, are maps run by Big Jesus? Which is another good question to ask. Uh, a question from the chat. Uh, did you cry throughout the final episode of season two of Take Us Home? And I'll extend that to the final episode of season one. I've not watched it, you know. See, the, um, the final episode of season two. I've watched, him, I've watched them all. I've even watched the first episode of season two. I don't know why I haven't finished it yet. I think I wanted to sit and watch it in like a more focused way. And I don't really do anything with any focus. So um, <laughs> I probably just should at some point. But yeah, I, I've heard it. I think, I've, I think because I've heard so many people talk about it, I wanted to dedicate like a special bit of time to watching it. And I've just never got around to it. Season one, I, don't, I didn't really want to cry. It just made me feel sick. It made me yeah. relive those feelings, and it wasn't. I was kind of beyond crying about it, but it just made me feel like it just I don't know. It felt like it was just a terrible breakup that someone was picking over the details of again. It's like, do you remember when that happened? You'd be like, oh god. Yep, I you know I remember when that happened. Thanks for bringing it up again. I remember all of it now. Jesus, why? Why did I ever believe? Yeah, and but it all worked out in the end. If 
if anything, we'll say that Amazon storytelling is incredible because they got Bielsa to throw that match so they could get two series in. Yeah, I wouldn't... Well, I was going to say I wouldn't change last year. I suppose it would have been nice to be there when we went up. Um, but it was it was fun. And I think maybe we're, we're in a stronger place for, for having got to the Premier League now. As Because as soon as I knew Bielsa was staying, I was actually all right with it. I think the thing... And the thing that probably came across on the grief cast when we did that was that at the point of losing to Derby, I thought it was likely Bielsa would leave and it would be a case of Bielsa leaves, Phillips leaves, Harrison doesn't, Harrison leaves, even though that first season he was kind of so so, but like it was just, it would be a demolition of a team again and it's, it'd be starting afresh and it felt like we would, we'd come so close, but it was going to be torn up because that's what always happens at the, in the championship. You get near and then the best bits get picked off and you, you're left to start again. The fact that we actually went it, it again for a second season, it was just, it, that was fine. Like I was, I was all right with it once I knew that was happening. Um, and as it turned out, I won't say I never had any doubts, but you know, it, it was fine. We did it with a massive margin of, in the end. So yeah. um, wouldn't change it. Am I right in thinking the grief cast is the one where you scream at a small child for being sad? <laughs> Um, I think it was a miserable bitch I, I ah, accused wonderful. her of being. <laughs> I didn't scream it in her face. Um, it was just, it was a just on uh, just over the internet. It, it was a, it was a, in part of Dan's story, it was a crying child who I th- thought should have been less upset. But I remember, I remember those days being. I remember like feeling like I wanted to cry at Leeds when we'd lost to like QPR once, and it was a completely meaningless game, and I, I still felt like I wanted to cry. So. I guess you're allowed to be a bit irrational when you're, yeah. when you're little. I had a six-a-side football match that same night, and I left when we were 2-0 up on aggregate. And then throughout the match, people were giving me updates, and I was in net myself, and I think we lost 5 or 6-1 <laughs> while Sleeds were getting demolished. So that that was a fun evening. Jesus. But it even was, It couldn't... was one of those that Go I'm on. sort of glad I was there for now, because yeah. it was memorable. I mean, even conceding five or six myself, I think I would have done better than Kiko did that evening. Yeah, he's, I'm, I'm amazed he's still here, really. I think it's just because we can't shift his wages, isn't it? But... How long was his contract again? I think it it's not short. I remember that much. Yeah, I don't. it's not over at the end of the... I think I'm pretty sure he's got another year after this one. We, we've just got to hope we can size him and send him on loan and someone will eventually go, all right, mm. fine. Yeah, I think it might end up just being a bit of a, a case of paying him off at some point. But I, I, I don't know. He, Bielsa seems to not mind him. So I don't know. It's funny. Maybe the I know when we interviewed Angus Kinnear, we kind of talked to him a bit, not on the podcast, but saying he, we asked him, like, is it something? And he just basically said, don't bother talking about it. I'm only going to repeat what the official club line is. Um, so we didn't <laughs> but it, Kiko has always maintained he didn't do it and I guess there's a degree of sympathy with the club and like what do you do if someone's just it would have been almost easier for the club if he'd have said I did say it but I didn't mean it and I shouldn't have said it and I'm willing to do something to make this right but when you met with the brick wall of someone saying nope. I just didn't yeah. just didn't do it despite a, f- a fair bit of maybe Slightly circumstantial evidence with people arguably hearing things or not hearing things on a pitch. Like there were, there were certain there were certain things within the the statement from the Charlton players that made you think: Did they actually hear it, or did one person think they hear, hear it and then told the other person who then made it that way in their head and stuff? But uh, I mean, it seemed likely to me that he had said it because his his defence wasn't very good. His defence was that he didn't know the word, which I just think was was bollocks. I can't remember how we got on to Kiko Casilla now. Uh, um, you being a better goalkeeper, that was it. Yeah, there we go. But yes, you, you probably are. To be fair, I think basically anyone's a better goalkeeper. Anyone that doesn't jump out of the way of the ball is probably a better goalkeeper. I think he's better than Wienvald, probably. I'm trying to remember. Was it the Brentford match last season where he basically passed it into his own net? Yeah, there was that one. But Wienvald also had a nightmare against 
Brentford once, I think. Oh, was that Lonigan? No, it was Lonigan. I think we dropped Viedval for being terrible. The Lonigan, Lonigan came in and did something terrible. It was just in that period when we, every, everything was going wrong. It, it, it's good to have a goalkeeper that we trust now, even if he is 13 years younger than the eldest goalkeeper at the club. He's great. I think he's got a good... He seems to have a nice kind of aura about him, does does Meslier. Like, he's nice and calm. When you see it, someone like... Compare him to someone like Jordan Pickford, who seems massively hyped up all the time. And Joe Hart used to do it to an extent as well. Like, particularly for England, he seemed to get so... He seems to get so built up about things that he couldn't focus properly, whereas Meslier seems sort of chilled out. And it seems like the sort of guy... Because he, he will make mistakes at some point, because you're bound to. But then I think he'll be all right with it. I don't think he'll let it bother him as much as some people. And he won't try and do anything daft to compensate for it. He'll just he'll just crack on with his normal game. So, yeah, I, I think he's great. Like I, I, Again, I'm looking around the Premier League and there's not particularly anyone I'd be desperate to swap him for. Yeah. Um, who is it that he's competing with to be France keeper? Is it the Fulham keeper at the minute? Ariola? Or... Um... Yeah, could be actually. He's, in, he's only in the under twenty ones, isn't he? Um, at the moment, but yeah, something like that. But I, I, I reckon, give him a few years, is probably in that sort of conversation. In the same way that weirdly Bamford is for England at the moment. Yeah, didn't see that coming. Got to Imagine be honest, saying that last year. <laughs> I know it's crazy. It's crazy. But I, I, people think we don't like Bamford, but like. I could, I'm thrilled for him. He's, he's always seemed like he's a nice bloke. He just couldn't score last year or not missed loads too many chances. And whereas this year, he's, he can't stop scoring and it's, it's great. Yeah, I've, I've just been reminded of the existence of Hugo Lloris, which, okay, fair enough, Tottenham keeper. But he's very good at breaking his own elbows. So maybe <laughs> Melia will be fine sneaking in that particular gap. Um, There was a question I was going to ask and I've completely forgotten what it is now. Um, what would you say is the number one worst moment as a lead fan? Um, God, as I mean, as one-off moments go, the relegations and the derby game are probably up there. But I think probably the actual worst were just those games where we we just lose against Blackburn on a Tuesday, and we'd be fifteenth, and you just think, "What's the fucking point?" Like we're going nowhere here. I think there was the, I think the, the non Premier League years were characterised by a, a general ebbing away of any hope. <laughs> over like over when we came up from League One, there was a bit of a bounce, but then after that, after those that first season up where we had Gradle and Becchio and there was a bit of and Snodgrass and there was a bit of a bit of momentum with us. It just we very quickly dropped in to so just drudgery and I think that was the most demoralising bit of it. As a one-off I'm trying to think if relegation from the Premier League or the Championship was worse probably the Premier League but then again I didn't think we'd be out of there that long I thought we'd have to do one or two years in the Championship we'd bounce back and it turns out that didn't um, quite happen. I'm quite old now and we've only just got, <laughs> we've only just got back so yeah so, um, yeah I, my main goal for this season was anything above relegation is fine. Going back down now is probably not good. Yeah, and it'd, it'd feel like it had... I feel like we can't go back down anytime soon because it is undo the joy of last season, and I'm not ready to give up on that. I don't want to hand that back. Yeah, g g g give it a few years, then... Maybe if all of our good footballers that cost twenty seven million quid become shit, then fair enough. Yeah. But by that we point can't. hopefully we'll have a bit of more of a foundation going, you know? We can't be relegated with BL, so we need to have some like we need to have Steve Bruce in charge or someone to get relegated. Yeah, by then we need to have panicked, got Allardyce in. <laughs> yeah. Someone will suggest it. They definitely will at some point. I mean, I'm sure people have suggested it this season already. Like when we lost to Wolves, I imagine someone was like, no, that's it, call it, project's over. Yeah, first few minutes against Liverpool, he was probably you know, always naive here, the way he's gone at this. But he is, he is the way he is. 
I mean, there's, there's something to be said for stubbornness to that extent that it just sort of starts working again, even though, in all logic, it just shouldn't. Mm. Um, I've got one more weird philosophy question. Does death actually matter? Mm, only for the people who are left. No, oh, that was so. my answer. Yeah. Oh, there you go. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not a believer in God or anything, so I I kind of think when you're done, you're done, and that's fine. I'm all right with that. Uh, so yeah, it, it doesn't think it affects you once you're right for the person who is dead, but obviously it leaves quite a depending on the circumstances of it, it can leave quite a a mess behind for everyone else. So it, it matters to them. Yeah. That that was that was basically the consensus. Like. I mean, it doesn't matter to me. I'm not there anymore. Other people might be sad, but <laughs> and I'd rather not be dead. Don't get me wrong. Well, yeah, I I think that applies to the vast majority of people. It's just that you know, it's uh, if I was, I wouldn't know about it, so it'd be fine as well. Yeah. Same thing with um, being like I don't know. Panorama National League fan and not having any way of learning the scores. We could be bottom, could be top. I don't, don't particularly care. We'll find out eventually, won't we? All right. Uh, do we have any more questions from the chat? I am asking the chat whilst I'm trying to scroll down because it's not loaded for a while. You've probably got a better idea than me right now because it's being a bit janky. I don't think there's anything there. Can I ask you questions about your headphones? Go on. What, what sort are they? And what are they noise cancelling? Um, I don't think they're particularly noise cancelling, especially since when I said areola a couple of minutes ago, Kayla shouted the word nipple at me. Um, it is a nipple. Yeah, I know it's a nipple. <laughs> uh, they are Steel Series somethings. I don't know what the something uh, is. Okay. But they cancel out a good amount of the noise. It's not like all of it, but it does a job, you know? Yeah, I was looking at, like, these are quite old, and I was looking at some of like active noise cancelling ones, you know, the ones that do mad shit with playing reverse sound waves at you and stuff. Oh, no, they, they don't do any of that. I've, I've, I've just stopped being a student. You think I can afford that? <laughs> I'm only um, doing it because now, now, because of lockdown, I'm... Um, my nice office that I've had to myself. My wife is now in as well, so I have to listen to her on calls. So I'm trying to trying to block out some of that noise. Yeah. Um. One bit that I did in the last interview. Uh. Do you have any weird, unanswerable questions that you've always pondered but haven't had a response to? Uh... Everyone's got that question, haven't they? The one where they're like, but I wonder what does. I don't know. Watermelon. Why is it a watermelon? <laughs> I could only think of like weird um, questions that you do, like when you're drunk, about would you rather X or Y that are all horrible and twisted. Oh, God. So I don't. I, I mean, don't know if that's within t uh, Twitch's terms of service. I have got uh, no yeah, idea what's coming here. It involves. It might involve bestiality. It's probably not. Um, Probably not. Although we did just play Quiplash and things probably touched on the Twitch terms of service at some points. I thought I thought anything went on Twitch. I thought it was like... Oh, not if I want to stay an affiliate. Ah, <laughs> uh, fair enough. I'll, I'll try not to ruin it for you. That's fine. I'll be honest, I'm probably more likely to ruin it for myself. Um, one question that I had the other day that like weirdly popped into my head. Who wins in a fist fight, Shrek or Batman? Did you ask that? I don't know. How tall is Shrek? Seven foot? Yeah, he's not he's not man size. he's not human man size, is he? He's big. Oh the thing he makes the films is like two people. Is Batman allowed gadgets or is it just a bear? We'll say with gadgets and without gadgets, and in one case Shrek has Donkey with him. I think no gadgets Shrek wins. He's got bulk. He's like a even even like a good a really fit lightweight boxer against a big bloke. If he gets hit, he's probably going to go down. Mm. Even if the even if the bigger man isn't as skillful. So I'm, I'm going to go Shrek without without the weapons. 
and yeah, then with, with, with the gadgets probably... and stuff, I think you're gonna you're probably gonna favour Batman. Uh, why is this a question? This is a question because chat wasn't coming back with any questions. Which Batman? It's a very good question. I think I think it's the same for all of them. Without gadgets, Shrek's gonna hurt them quite bad. I mean, if you're going like original Batman from the where it was like a really thin lycra suit and he wasn't even particularly muscly, then. Even with gadgets, she got problems. Yeah. Unless I know a... Batman now. Modern Batman's very like he looks all sort of Kevlar, doesn't he? And yeah. He looks, he looks invincible. Uh, I think that's probably a good point to leave it there, to be honest. Because <laughs> <laughs> why not end it on Shrek versus Batman? Fair enough. Fair enough. All right. So uh, thank you for coming. It's been very, very nice of you. It's all right. Thank you very much. All right, uh, and uh, if anyone wants to stick around, please do. I'll probably be playing quite a spooky game whilst it's still Halloween. I don't like those in the slightest, but yeah, it's going to happen. I'm not going to be very happy for a while, so if you like seeing Misery, I mean, you follow Michael on Twitter, you probably are a Leeds fan. You're used to miserable, miserable times. Uh, yeah, that'll be coming up in a little bit. Um, so yeah, thanks for popping on, Michael. No worries. Uh, Good luck if... with the rest of it. What, what time? When are you 24 hours up? Oh, it's 2 p.m. Why did you start at 2 p.m.? That's a very odd to... when I start in the morning. You see, I started at 2 p.m. because I figured I can have a lie in in the morning. That's not going to make me too tired. And for the last two hours, there's a uh, Formula One race on. So, what I'm going to do, I'm going to have a watch along with uh... other people so I don't have to talk too much. Yeah, fair enough. Yeah. So if anyone has any spare pennies, it'd be lovely if you could donate. Uh, other than that, thank you for popping along. No bother. And uh, yeah, see you later. Bye, everyone. That was nice.